lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing better after mixing these cocktails up. Yeah, me as well. <laughs> it's been a long day. Yeah, and it's been storming, so um, you may hear some extra sound <laughs> yeah. during the podcast. Yeah. One of those sounds may be turning <laughs> on a flashlight, because... I have lost power more than once already. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the good news is that the podcast setup, at least for the recording part, doesn't require external power. Yeah. Yeah. I was um, on the way over here and when all the lights were like off, mm -hmm. I was like, well, if you don't have power, we can still record. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. We can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I, because I honestly, I had considered, I was like, oh man, like if you don't have power, maybe I should just head home. Yeah. But, then was, but then it like immediately hit me. I was like, wait a minute. We don't need power. It does introduce a complication. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, but, yeah. Yeah. But it's it's definitely still doable. So um, if uh, if GI Greg's listening, he'll like this. We're drinking the Scofflaw. Oh yeah. I, I made my own grenadine, so I've been yeah working through various grenadine drinks and. This is a good one. It's like on I am, list. I am very impressed. Mm. Like I guess maybe it is the the homemade grenadine. I don't know, but it's got a bit of a like a twang to it, but yeah. like a sharp twang, but I like it. Like, it, like it, when you say sharp twang, is that what I would describe as tart? Maybe. Like, like maybe. a little, little pucker. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. 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 I, um, I think that's it. The, the homemade grenadine is not as sweet as, yeah. as store bought, but I like it. Like it adds something to it. Like it's, it's definitely a, it's mm. a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've always enjoyed this one. You know, it's a sour. I'm, I'm a big fan of sours anyway. And yeah. Yeah. All that other stuff. Yeah. Good drinks. Mm -hmm. And whiskey. It's like one of the best whiskey sour cocktails. It's not like just a whiskey sour. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm yeah. also a big fan of. <laughs> <laughs> right. But hey, um, there's something else I wanted to bring. We were just discussing Firefly. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, it's time, how, it's time to rewatch again. And how everyone should watch Firefly. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, that is just the greatest series ever. Well, and what I, I got another friend that if she's listening to this, she's going to be screaming at me that, no, it's Twin Peaks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a close call, actually. Yeah. Um, and I, I think over the last few years, I've started to fall more on the side of Firefly than, yeah. than the original. It's such, it's such a good series and it's it it's one i always like to go back to every year or so mm -hmm. because like when you rewatch it after you hadn't watched it in a long time yeah it's in all series are that way to me like i like mm -hmm. to go back and rewatch really good series mm -hmm. and um because you kind of forget things you know like, yeah it's just <laughs> i was watching an episode last night um and it's the the episode it's the train job okay do you remember the train I job do. episode okay yeah. <laughs> when um uh, Jane's trying to take over the ship. Yeah. Uh, cause captain and Zoe are, are indisposed. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and the whole, the whole sequence where he passes out <laughs> <laughs> yes. had me almost rolling on the floor <laughs> laughing. I had oh, forgotten man. just how funny that bit is. It's just, Oh, it was so well executed. It was so funny. Yeah. I laughed really hard. I laughed really hard, and then I backed it up, and I laughed and really did hard it again. again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so oh, good. So I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, I, I decided uh, when I got back from New Orleans that um, that this was a series that I needed to watch again. That it, it had was, been it had it, been long. It had been long enough, exactly. <laughs> um, which for me is just like a few months. I kind of like yeah. to watch it like quarterly. Quarterly. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. Um, so, but uh, yeah, so I started watching it again, and I've nice. been really digging it. Like, oh yeah, so good. So, so any of you out there who haven't seen Firefly, yes. highly recommend. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. top of the list. Absolutely. Um, in not so fun news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's okay. So I I couldn't. I ended up not doing a podcast last week. I I did seriously consider doing one solo, but I couldn't. I couldn't find. I couldn't find a way to focus myself on a topic. Like I was kind of all over the place and um, like just a bunch of different little interests that were going on that I thought about talking about and I couldn't, I couldn't narrow it down. I couldn't focus. So I ended up just not doing anything at all. <laughs> so you got nothing instead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was kind of silly of me, I guess, but oh, well, um, 
but I, I did lose track of news for a couple of days during the weekend, which was a shame because then I found out on Sunday uh, that uh, Daniel Ellsberg had died. Yeah. And that was sad. Yeah. And we've talked about Daniel Ellsberg many times on this podcast yeah. at, at this point, but he, um, he died uh, on Friday. Uh, he's like 92 or 93. He's, oh, wow. he's an old man. I didn't realize he was yeah. quite up there that high. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was working for the department of defense in 1964 or oh, something wow. like that. And he was, oh, at the, yeah. he was at the Rand corporation before that. Yeah. Um, I think if I have the timeline, right. Yeah. But uh, anyway, this is the guy who released the Pentagon Papers um, yeah. to the New York Times and uh, easily cut years off of the Vietnam War through those leaks. Yeah. Um, and, and, and like you could probably make a case that the man almost single handedly ended the Vietnam War. Yeah. <laughs> um, by exposing to the American public that the government was lying about how the war was going. Yeah. Um, like it was, what was knowingly really, lying yeah. about how the war was going. Yeah. Um, now, to me, like that's a that's a, the the man should get a medal. Um, instead, he got prosecuted. But we'll get to that in a minute because that's how that always goes. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, right. More importantly to me, like what he had done um, at Rand Corporation and when he first went to DOD as well, I think um, was he was a nuclear war planner. Yeah. And so he has a book. Uh, called the Doomsday Machine, um, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, that I recommend everybody read. It yeah. is horrifying. Yeah. Like, truly horrifying. But he exposes just how um, disjointed and... Uh, well, he introduces the, the term omnicide in the book, which is to kill everything. Yeah. Like, everything, everything. <laughs> everything, yeah. Um, and... Uh, and he says that's what these plans amount to. Yeah. Um, is just on the side. Yeah. And, uh, but he talks about how, you know, the idea that the authority to launch a nuclear war resides at the president and nowhere else. He's like, that's just a lie. Like, there's, mm. there's hundreds of people down the chain of command who could initiate a nuclear war. Really? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe not intentionally. Yeah. In, in the sense that like they can give orders to other people to, but you know, just like a pilot flying around with a nuclear warhead under his plane All he's can got potentially is, start yeah, a nuclear yeah. war. All he's got to do is press the button, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it's um, literally at his fingertips. Yeah. Either ignore orders or get orders without countermanding orders. And you know, there's lots of things that can go wrong with communication that could result in this. And, and then just the idea of like the way they had the plan set up where they had, uh, you know, multiple strikes on the same location. But the problem is that like every one of these explosions creates problems with getting the next payload to its proper destination. And yeah. I, I mean, it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of, un, it, it's like surreal. Yeah. Um, and you can't believe that people would do this, but he also introduces the, um, the little anecdote in there that uh, he and a friend of his um, from the Rand corporation went to see, uh, Dr. Strangelove when yeah. it came out. So the Stanley Kubrick movie, Dr. Strangelove or yeah. how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, which is the <laughs> subtitle of that particular film. Yeah. He says, so the two of them went and saw the movie um, and they came out of there and they were like, you know, that's supposed to be a satire, but it could be a documentary. <laughs> really? So those of you who haven't read this book, but have seen Dr. Strangelove, just think about that for a moment. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Anyway, I think like a real hero, uh, this guy, he worked tires tirelessly to try and bring an end to, uh, you know, to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, he, uh, like once he left the government, um, he exposed a lot. He, uh, supported like strongly supported whistleblowers throughout, um, yeah. the hi history after him. Yeah. Um, and uh, did everything he can could for them. And at the end of his life, he was actually trying to create another case where they would bring, um, uh, uh, what do you call them, the uh, Espionage Act charges against him again. Like he was ready to go to jail to try and get a case brought in front of the Supreme Court on about the Espionage Act. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, and then he got pancreatic cancer and then he died. Yeah. 
So, you know, rest in peace, Daniel Ellsberg. But um, a- as a part of that, he he was prosecuted under the Espionage Act of 1917. Now, this is Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson administration um, uh, legislation that was really used by the Wilson administration to... Um, to, I'm not going to say prosecute because I think it was only used one time during that period, yeah. but um, to deter um, anti-war protests yeah. and people speaking out against the war. It was, it was expressly created to use against American citizens um, to prevent them from spreading, uh, uh, let's see, what, like I guess pushback against, propaganda. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, to keep them from spreading any kind of um, rebellion against the U.S. wars or U.S. involvement in World War One, because it wasn't really popular. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, Daniel Ellsberg's case uh, after the Pentagon Papers, it, it ended up being thrown out. <laughs> and the story of that is just funny in and of itself. It's, it's because the Nixon administration, the judge threw out the case because he found that the Nixon administration had... Um, had acted criminally against Daniel Ellsberg in the prosecution of the case. Really? And what they had done is the, 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 um, CIA plumbers, like these same guys that got caught in Watergate, yeah. um, had broken into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office and stolen Ellsberg's records to try and use something, you know, <laughs> something private between him and his psychiatrist against him. Oh, wow. Um, and the <laughs> that's you know, pretty the, devious, right yeah. there. <laughs> and so the judge was like, "Okay, now we can't, yeah, we can't yeah. permit that." Like I'm just throwing this case out. Yeah. But before the case got thrown out, um, the the judge had uh, ruled that the Espionage Act is a strict liability law. Okay. Now, what that means is that you know Daniel Ellsberg's. Um, expected defense of explaining why he released the information that he did, why he thought it was in the public interest to know that the government was lying, why they, you know, these kind of things. Yeah. Essentially, um, the, the strict liability law definition, um, preempts that kind of argument. That's not an excuse. Like you can't create excuses. Like you can't yeah. justify the act through the reasoning for the act. Um, it essentially means that, uh, any violations of the espionage act, are criminal regardless of the circumstances. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, no question about whether it's in, uh, you know, the, the greater good to release the information, no question about, well, it was exposing criminal acts of the government. Therefore it's justified. None of that. No. If you released any from any information that falls under the espionage act, you are a criminal period. So that's crazy. So like if you were, Let's just say there were things going on in in the Iraq war where they were, you know, killing civilians and this type of thing. Um, And you had documents proving that you would you could be charged under the Espionage Act for releasing said documents. Yes. And that's that's just insanity. Yeah. Um, And it's been taken advantage of since then. It, It. well, it created a precedent which essentially said that when government is acting um, against the interests of the people or in a criminal way, yeah. if they classify documentation of it, then it's no, criminal to nothing, release it no matter yeah, what. There's nothing that can be done about it. Yeah. It's just hidden forever. So it, it created this, uh, this culture in the government where classification is used to cover up um, government malfeasance. Yeah. Well, uh, rightfully so. Like, well, not rightfully. Well, so, not but. rightfully so, but I mean that's that's. I mean, when you create a system like that, like mm-hmm. yeah, of you course, you got to expect it's going to be taken advantage well, of. Well, absolutely, way. yeah. Especially when you're dealing with government. Yeah. Um, now, just to create some perspective on this, though, uh, the Espionage Act was only used to prosecute people twice between 1917 um, and through the. Uh, even through the Bush administration, oh, the wow. uh, W. Bush administration. So who was the and other? And one person? of them was Daniel Ellsberg. Yeah. So who was the other? I don't. Oh, you don't. I know. don't. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure it was like a test case with during the Wilson administration, but I'm not. 100% oh, okay. On that. Well, that would make sense. Yeah. Um. So but this I'm not 100 virtually on that. never been used. Yeah. Other than like two times. Yeah. And, until Obama. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Who remember ran on a you know a transparent government? You know everybody should see what the, the what the government's doing. You know our administration is going to be the most transparent ever. Yeah. Now in his eight years in office, Obama used or the Obama administration yeah. used the Espionage Act to prosecute whistleblowers eight times. Oh wow! <laughs> All right, but yeah. even Obama. Um, wouldn't use the Espionage Act against Julian Assange as a publisher. They were afraid of the, you know, what what kind of problems that what, would create. What the other publishers might have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, of course, Trump came into office and uh, didn't did. Didn't hesitate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did use the Espionage Act um, to prosecute or try to prosecute Julian Assange. Charge, yeah. Made Espionage Act charges against Julian Assange. I guess that's the way Which is also it. interesting because Julian Assange is not a U.S. citizen. Yeah, that's also a problem. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the Espionage Act is, um, the idea of it is that it's uh, U.S. citizens that are releasing information, uh, you know, that could be dangerous to United States security to foreign powers. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not how it's used either. Yeah. Um, it's used against U.S. citizens that really, and apparently not U.S. citizens also now, yeah. um, who release information that's damaging to the U.S. government to the press. Yeah. Yeah, which is insanity. Um, now, in, I guess, a bit of poetic justice here, um, now the Espionage Act is being used against Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so he's facing Espionage Act charges now. Yeah. Bet he wishes he pardoned Assange now. Right. <laughs> um, but he lit, I'm pretty sure it was Pompeo that really kind of pushed the Julian Assange thing. Pompeo really had it out for Julian Assange. Yeah. Um, still does. I was going to say, that guy's got it out for everybody, man. Like. <laughs> yeah. You know, I. We never did come back and talk about that interview that he did with, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Stossel, did we? Oh, no, we didn't. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure we didn't. I don't think we did either. Yeah. Damn, we, we might still have to do that at some point. Yeah. Um, especially, well, you know, we can wait, I suppose, until it, it's certain that he's running for president and has any kind of a shot whatsoever oh, well, to get the well, Republican Then, then we'll nomination. never have that conversation because oh, okay. he has no shot. Like, he may run. But, dude, like... I one bet he could pick up some support from the Republicans. You really think so? I think I, so. I don't know, man. Like, I I just don't see it, man. Especially if Donald Trump's in jail. Well, <laughs> that who knows? Like, He actually seems quite reasonable. The guy's smart. Yeah. Um, which is more know. than I can say for a lot of He's, candidates. He just you know? seems like a stooge to me. Like, he comes off as stooge o'clock, man. <laughs> Did you watch the interview? I heard snippets of it. Okay. You should watch the interview. Yeah. Um, now he's he's definitely got an agenda. Like the guy is deep state through and through. Like yeah. one, you know, always well, CIA. But that's the reason that I just don't think he has a chance is because like well, there was that guy in Arizona in twenty sixteen that had a pretty good run. Was yeah. it Arizona? Or I don't Utah? Know. Utah, I think, actually. Who was it? I don't um, remember. I can't remember his name. Uh but he was uh, like a former C like a retired CIA guy. Yeah. Um who was running in Utah and got a pretty good percentage of the vote. Yeah. Just there because he was from there and he's a Mormon and so oh, yeah, but right. um <laughs> but still like Yeah. He got some message out there. Yeah. He had some support and he was he was retired CIA like yeah. openly. Yeah. Well, I mean like So, I mean, I don't know. I, pump like people have gotten behind the intelligence communities in a lot of, a I, lot I, of ways. I know they have in the past. I just I don't know, and maybe this is just me. It just feels like we're in a different time now. I would like to believe that's true, but I don't think that it is. Uh, it may not be. Like, I may be completely wrong about that, but the environment feels so much different now compared to where it was. Even in 2016, when Trump came through, um, things are just so crazy right now, yeah. as far, especially as far as like people just seeing through the bull. Well, I'm there's just, certainly more of that. Um, I mean, we'll see how things go when people get all worked up about campaigns. Yeah. Because I think people kind of lose their minds at that point and stop thinking and, critically. And they do. Um, they so. just want to make sure that the other guy doesn't win. Oh, yeah. They'll yeah. vote for anybody to make sure that the other guy doesn't win. Trump's yeah. proven that. Biden's proven that. I mean, it's... Oh, it's 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 <laughs> tried and true. Like, yeah. it's it's been proven over time. But there is something to say about, like, the other side doesn't look as... 
like as much like the enemy as it used to. When and I'm talking specifically about RFK. Yeah. Like if you're a Republican and you start looking at RFK, you kind of start shrugging your shoulders like, I don't know, man, this guy makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, but the same thing could happen on the left. Like if you're one of those people on the left that has fallen in and decided that the, you know, the CIA and the FBI are the greatest institutions that have ever existed, which is like yeah. becoming oh, yeah. a far more popular opinion on the left than I would have ever imagine. <laughs> it's true. Um, then maybe looking at the former CIA guy who's talking some sense yeah. and sounds like he knows what he's talking about and has inside information that he doesn't quite share with you, but continuously hints that he has. The, yeah. Yeah. The guy, like maybe that guy starts to look pretty good. It's Especially po- it's if you're not possible. a Democrat, you just like lean left, but you're not, you're like nonpartisan. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. You're not wrong. Um, Interesting times we live in. (laughs) No kidding. (laughs) So as far as the Trump thing is concerned, uh, he might actually really be in trouble here. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems to me that by the letter of the law, he did break the law. Yeah. Uh, And um, which is which is interesting because at least as I understand his defense is he's just like, I have the right to do this. Well, okay, so um, I heard an interview with uh, Judge Napolitano. Okay. um, Who was talking about that some of the information that he had, uh, like particularly these um, Iran war plans, he couldn't have had outside of a secure area even while he was president. Really? That he doesn't have the right to declassify this information. So he can't, he can't even, yeah, he wouldn't even have the right to declassify it? Yeah. Um, Interesting. And so, like, some of this kind of information. Like, he's just stuck. Yeah. Especially because he's openly admitted that he had it. Oh, yeah. Now, I do find it interesting that this, like, this um, this kind of conversation where he admits that he had it... Yeah. ...is about how the... How like, he was being pushed into this war and not the other way around. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, like, they came at me with these plans to have this war, and I said no. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, there's, it, and it's interesting that the media doesn't seem to cover that aspect of it at all. Yeah. Like, it's, that's not even part of the conversation. Well, there's a lot of things that the media isn't covering. Yeah. Um, I, that's certainly part of it. Like, everybody's, like, really excited uh, that Trump may be going to jail. And he may be going to jail. Um, and they say, you know, finally, uh, the law is being applied equally to everyone, but it's not. No. I mean, actually, this is a clear indication that it's not. I mean, it is yeah. nice to see somebody who had has had that level of power in the United States being held to account. Yeah. Because that doesn't happen very much. No, no, it absolutely doesn't but happen. But there's some other people out there right now yeah. who've done essentially Far the same worse. thing. I mean, or yeah. worse. Or yeah, worse, yeah. That aren't being prosecuted. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think. Well, and this isn't the here. Here's what you have to remember, and this is kind of just my spin on it, though, is that like Trump's not, regardless of what they say in court, Trump's not being held to account for having the documents and taking them home because they've all done it. Like this, whenever they started this with Trump, everybody started coming out of the woodwork that had documents they shouldn't have had. Yeah. Um. Yeah, mishandling classified information isn't the issue. Yeah, because no. like Trump. Hillary Clinton had a server with yes, <laughs> uh, who only who knows? I yeah. mean, she destroyed thirty thousand emails, so we don't even know. So how we much don't. Classified so we'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So just bear in mind the people, particularly the people who are rooting this on mm-hmm. that, like, I mean, it's okay. Like, you may get rid of this guy over this. But just know that the thing that you're getting him on isn't the reason you're getting rid of him. Because yeah. the truth is, is, if he wasn't running for president again, I don't think that we'd be dealing with this. Well, um, and I was think, it a Rachel think, Maddow? Like it was somebody on Rachel Maddow, or it might have been Rachel Maddow herself. Yeah. Um, that was talking about exactly that and um, saying that well, you know, usually there's some kind of plea. But he doesn't have anything to offer. The only thing he can offer is an agreement not to run for office. Yeah. And, and that was it's Rachel just like, yeah. okay. And it was like, well, yeah, that's exactly, that's the whole point that of all of this. That is the point. Like, that's the game here. Because why, if, if that wasn't the point, how would that even be a bargaining chip? Yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly the point. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what's at play here. Mm-hmm. Um, the optics of it for the government are really bad. Just yeah. in general, the whole idea that we're gonna you know lock up 
somebody. I mean, this is banana republic territory. Well, that that's the the issue that's I think that's being glossed over a little too much is that you have um, an administration prosecuting bureaucratic crimes essentially yeah. uh, on the person who's likely to be the biggest challenger to that administration. Exactly. And um, we would certainly be calling that out if it was happening anywhere else. Oh, without Even question. if it was legitimate yeah. charges. And I think it is legitimate charges, actually. Yeah. Um, but it's legitimate charges that have never been used against somebody of his stature. Yeah. In terms yeah. of, like, level of government oh, influence absolutely. And, and power. Like, it's, it's uh, charges that are so, used against... Like people that are below officer level in the U.S. military and that this, kind of thing. This does kind of get into my crawl as far, especially with like what Napolitano said that that generally speaking he wouldn't have access or be able to declassify these documents. Well, not even all, of them, as but there, there are some documents yeah. within this group. That but even even like you're talking about the the Iran stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, he's the commander in chief. Yeah, these are war plans. Like. How does he not have that authority to have control over these? Like, I mean, he is yeah. the commander in chief. Like, I don't know. I, the, according to Napolitano, it's some kind of special carve out for these kinds of documents. Yeah, but you end up operational but, plans are super, super, super secret, like beyond classified secret. Yeah, like, but when you're the man, that's the difference, though. When you're the man at the top, you mm -hmm. are the president, the commander in chief. Like, you control the military. Mm -hmm. Like these, you should have the, that's, that's where you end up in this like constitutional crisis like area where like, well, who does really have the authority here? Yeah. Well, it, it makes me wonder like, what if he had tweeted out some aspect of the plans? Yeah. Like he didn't release the plans, like the documents didn't go anywhere, but he had tweeted something about like some aspect of the plans to attack Iran. Yeah. So then is he under the Espionage Act? Yeah. Like, while he was president. Yeah. What while about, he was, <laughs> like, what? Yeah. I don't know. It's it's a weird thing. I, I don't understand it. I mean, this is, you know, way beyond well, my legal expertise. I'm oh, absolutely. Aware. Well, me too. I'm just trying to think through this logically, you yeah. know. Um, but the truth is, I think you're right. Like, I think he's in trouble, like serious trouble here. Mm -hmm. um, and I th honestly, I think the only thing he's got playing in his favor is that he is running for president. And the fact is that he can drag these proceedings out through the campaign and... Like, so what happens if he does drag these proceedings all the way through the election and all of a sudden he's elected president again with this hanging over his administration? Can he pardon himself? Yeah. That's a question. <laughs> um, that's, that's well, one or of can they even charge him questions. once he's in office again? Yeah, because as Nixon told us that the president does it, it's legal. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> like, I don't know. There's all kinds of crazy stuff here. I, I personally, I was saying it the other day to some friends of mine. I just, I don't think, I don't think they let him take the oath of office again. Yeah. Like, I just, I don't see it. Like, all of this is a attempt to keep that from happening again. Mm -hmm. And you know, like Trump or not like Trump, I, I don't think it's happening. Well, okay. So, what about the stuff with Biden? These accusations huh. of Biden taking bribes from Ukraine. Well, so I heard yesterday. I don't know. I've been kind of behind on the news myself. But um, Hunter pleaded out, if I'm not mistaken, right? I don't know. I hadn't uh, really yeah. keeping up with this. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah. Yeah, Hunter made uh, pled out to All some charges. All I know charges. is that there's been accusations and uh, apparently an FBI whistleblower who says that they have documentation that um, that Joe Biden, as vice president, was taking money from uh, Ukraine. Oh, well, I don't some doubt. Some way or, and I, or another. I do not doubt that. And China, for a I think, too. But, um, yeah. yeah, but I'm curious to see kind of how, with Hunter pleading out to some charges, and it was like a gun charge and tax evasion, is my understanding, what he pled to. Yeah. Oh. Like how that's going to— It's meaningless stuff. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, you're right. Like, yeah. I hadn't thought about it. I haven't really thought about that from my perspective, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah meaningless are, stuff. Yeah, right. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just, uh, that it's not getting a lot of press, it seems to me, or it's just like being well, it's, brushed it is, aside. As, it is amazing that all of that's being brushed aside, the stuff mm -hmm. that's going on with Biden right now, mm -hmm. and that the Trump thing is what's in the news. Yeah. Because the stuff that's going on with Biden, however you feel about Biden, like 
we're like giving massive amounts of money to Ukraine right now. Yeah. And for him to have even, even for the notion to be out there that he was taking bribes from Ukraine as vice president. Mm -hmm. And now that he's president, we're just writing checks. Him billions of dollars. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like there's a scandal there. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, since neither of us know a lot about that, we're not going to spend much time on it. Yeah. I mean, um, Go ahead. But no, I was just saying, like, I mean, it just, it, it, it's crazy to me that we could be in the situation we're in in Ukraine and that we won't even, like, take a look at this. Yeah. The media, I mean, like, not, you know, us, I guess. It's not really a surprise. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not a surprise, but, but it is just astonishing to me because, I mean, we've got a mess in that part of the world right now. Mm -hmm. um, and to think that we could have a president that was, as as a VP taken vibe, vibe bribes. Well, luckily, because of all that money that Biden has sent to Ukraine, they're winning. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> can't see sarcasm on a podcast. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. I I did actually talk to somebody this uh, earlier this week that um that I was talking to about ending the war in Ukraine. Yeah. And this person was in. I mean, we have very different political perspectives, but this person was in agreement with me that. The, you know, military industrial stuff, bad need to stop wars, et cetera. Yeah. But he said, but not if it comes to appeasement. Oh yeah. That's... And I was like, well, what's the alternative? Yeah. Like, what do you have in mind? <laughs> right. Because to me, the alternative is you don't make a deal and people keep dying and more destruction happens in Ukraine. You think that that's a better alternative than saying, Hey, Putin, you know what? You've got some demands. We're going to meet a bunch of them if you'll just stop this. Because yeah. I, I was like, man, Russia's winning this. Well, and the and, goal. and you know what he said to me? He's like, well, I don't think that that's true. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, okay, but you're wrong. Yeah. Like Russia is winning yeah. this. I, I know TV may have told you that, <laughs> that, the, that the Ukrainians, Ukrainians are, are doing... valiant, you know. Yeah. But, defense but it, of their country, but yeah, it can only last so long. Well, and that's even even if you watch the mainstream, because I do, like I watch a lot of mainstream news actually, um, and even listening to them, I mean, they're given the whole, you know, Ukraine's doing good and Ukraine's fighting valiantly and blah, blah, blah. But I don't even know that you can take from them that they're like winning. Yeah. Like, I well, mean, it, it's certainly because, not at this point. The, um, this offensive, the Ukraine's spring offensive, now summer, yeah, offensive, uh, has not even gotten through um, the defensive buffer zone that the Russians had set up. Yeah, I mean, nowhere. They're like, they're like, like, my, they my have under not broken through the defensive buffer zone anywhere where they've attacked. My understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I've been known to be periodically like they're like taking over like fields and shit, right? Uh, well, sometimes, but the Russians have actually started moving the other direction now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was my, my, my understanding was that they were, like, just going into, like, farmland and stuff and reclaiming it, like... <laughs> yeah, um, the, the Russians have set up good defensive lines. They have, um, they have a buffer zone, as, as I understand it, roughly 25 kilometers. Yeah. And that the Ukrainians have not been able to penetrate that buffer zone even. Really? Like, to get to the real... Fight lines of the russians wow um and uh at this point um i mean they've lost a lot trying to get as far as they have and they haven't really made any progress yeah and so the next <laughs> thing that happens is what has started to happen already yeah which is the russians are like okay well they're petering out against our defensive lines time yeah. to start moving forward again yeah right <laughs> and uh yeah we'll see what happens from here now a couple of weeks ago, when we last did a podcast, um, I spent a lot of time criticizing Anthony Blinken All right. All about right. not doing his job. <laughs> and in fact, the same guy that I was talking to um, this uh, earlier this week asked me if I was a bird. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, here we go. It's the bird. <laughs> I, I was like really confused about the start of a question, by the way. Yeah. Um, it didn't seem in line with what the way we had been talking to that point. Yeah. But if I was a bird, yeah. um, whose head would I poop on? Yeah. And I was like, ooh, 
That's a tough one. I had to think about that. Yeah. And so my, my first answer was Dick Cheney. Yeah. Because like he screwed this country up more than anybody else alive right now, I think. Yeah. Um, but then I was like, no, 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 wait, he doesn't really have any power anymore. Yeah. Right. I don't now, know. He has a daughter. That's true. She didn't really have any power anymore either. Um, so I, I said, okay, so no, no, no. Right now, I think it would be Anthony Blinken. Yeah. And he was very confused as to why I would choose Anthony Blinken. Yeah. And I said what I said on the podcast, which is he, he's the worst secretary of state since Foster Dulles. Yeah. That he's not doing his job. He's just got, he's not, he's supposed to be America's chief diplomat and he's just going around threatening people. He's not. He's not doing, doing any the job. diplomacy. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, but I have to soften up a little bit because he went to Beijing. Yeah. And he did some diplomacy, finally. Oh. Hey, way to go, man. Nice. So he, he went to Beijing. He met with some people. He did some diplomacy. He said that we don't support Taiwanese independence, that yeah. we believe in the one China policy. By the way, that's going to have to change some of our military actions because right. um, if uh, Taiwan is part of China, then we can't send boats between Taiwan and China like we have been. Like I was going to say, I'm pretty sure we're doing that now, all right? Yeah, but not anymore. If we accept that, then it's against international law for us to move ships in between in the strait between the the, two, the Taiwanese yeah. island and the Chinese mainland. Yeah. Um, but that's beside the point for now. Anyway, yeah. he met with people. He he made nice. They said that they had frank discussions. Yeah. Which, what did you say he thought that that meant earlier? That that both sides just kind of laid their cards on the table and, and said kind of, this is where I'm at. And they said where there's at, where they're at. And yeah. Like, I, just I, honest discussion. Yeah. So uh, I don't know what really that means in, in diplomatic speak, but I think that that's probably a fairly accurate description. of. I what, mean, it seems right to me. Yeah. So um, we had taken a step towards trying to, you know, resolve conflict with China before things got out of hand because things are not going well yeah. uh, between yeah. us and China right now. No joke. And so literally a day later, yeah. Biden at a, at a campaign event says this. No, but I really mean it. China is real. Has real economic difficulty. I'm going to try and do it like the way Biden would, by the way. <laughs> right. um, so, th so this is a quote, right? <laughs> yeah, this is a quote. Well, that part wasn't, but okay. I, I'll have to start over. All right, now. let's start over from quote. quote. Yes. So this is just one paragraph from his little speech at this campaign event. Okay. No, but I really mean it. China is real. Has real economic difficulties. And the reason why Xi Jinping got very upset in terms of when I shot that balloon down with two boxcars full of spy equipment in it is he didn't know it was there. No, I'm serious. <laughs> That's what a great embarrassment for dictators. That's what's a great embarrassment for dictators, when they didn't know what happened. That wasn't supposed to be going where it was. It was blown off course up through Alaska and then down through the United States. And he didn't know about it. When it got shot down, he was very embarrassed. He denied it was even there. <laughs> All right, so there's a bunch of issues. <laughs> Right. This. Yeah, think <laughs> <laughs> like one is the problem that he just called Xi Jinping a dictator. Yeah. After we finally made a little bit of uh, inroads. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is like all this stuff about the balloon. Like he makes like five different statements about the balloon. Yeah. And none of them can be true if any of the others are true. Right. <laughs> right. So if it's if it's a spy balloon. Full of spy, uh, uh, how much spy equipment Two was in box there? Two boxcars full of spy equipment. <laughs> yeah. That he didn't know was there. That's some really bad, that must be some Soviet <laughs> spy equipment <laughs> yeah, is all right. I can come up with. Like <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Like, if it's spy equipment. Yeah. It knew where it was at. <laughs> <laughs> you would think. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> and they didn't know what happened. That wasn't supposed to be going where it was. Yeah. You mean it wasn't meant to spy on us? Yeah, right. <laughs> it got blown off course up through Alaska and then down through the United States. Oh, okay. Well, where was it? Who was he trying to spy who was it? on? Yeah. What, did, did it miss? Uh, was <laughs> yeah. it supposed to go to Canada and came to us instead? <laughs> and he didn't know about it. <laughs> well, well, it's possible. High level spying there. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, don't know. It just. Yeah. You, you can't. You, 
it's Biden, man. Like you can't make heads or tails of what he's talking about. Yeah. But but it is the the point is well taken though that that it after coming off of a good uh, meeting or whatever, then uh, you've got the president coming out and saying some stuff that's incendiary to the to the people we were just trying to meet with. Yeah. Like I mean, and that's the problem. Yeah. Yep, he's he's not a very good diplomat either. <laughs> no, right? it t- as it would turn out, yeah. the guy taking money from Ukraine. And really, I, while I say the Secretary of State is America's chief diplomat, yeah, actually, America's chief diplomat really is the president. Well, yeah, I mean, the president is the figurehead that's supposed to be pointing out towards the rest of the world. Well, and it's it's supposed to be the representat- representative of the United States to the rest of the world. Well, and w- the way I always understood it, and I mean, this may have changed a little bit under Trump, like mm-hmm. whatever the president says is supposed to be policy. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know. Well, they keep trying to walk that back. Well, they kept trying to walk it back with Trump and they keep trying to walk it back with Biden, too. Yeah. Because most of these both of these people say stupid things. Well, yeah, it's true. <laughs> but I mean, traditionally, prior to Trump, mm-hmm. like that is the way it worked. Like whatever yeah. the president said, like that was policy, and the people under him and behind him are were, responsible for enacting it. For ma- yeah, we're for mm-hmm. making changes to course pertinent upon what the president wanted to do. Yeah, you know, but well, that, but our presidents are terrible, so we don't like that policy. Well, no, anymore. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not specifically advocating for that specifically, but but I mean it. It is frustrating though when you have a president with a good policy that it doesn't get followed through with at all. Yeah. Like you know, but not then, that Trump was perfect, but he did yeah. have some good good directions he wanted to go that was completely thwarted. Yeah, like leaving Syria. Yeah, like that's a good example. Um, I wish they had uh, had bucked his policy about leaving the JCPOA. Yeah. Or the INF. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> there, there are like really terrible things that Trump did that I wish that they hadn't enacted his policies. And then there are things that he wanted to do that I think were really important that I'm really upset that they didn't. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the man behind the curtain, you know. Yeah. Well, it it just goes to show that the you know we put all this faith in the president as being the most power, you know, the leader of the free world. Yeah. He didn't even lead his own nation. Yeah. Well, and that's not where the power lies. And I made he's uh, he's a target. He's yeah. a figurehead and a target. Yeah. And, and I think Trump proves that more than any of them because if if you ever had a president that wanted to come in and make real change Mm -hmm. like trump is a good example of how difficult that's going to be yeah how easily it is thwarted by the the permanent bureaucracy and blame trump plenty because the truth is is he could have appointed better people and he could have been smarter about how he wielded his power yeah because all of that's true it is um he didn't know what he was doing yeah he was ineffective Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and it all goes back to the people he put in this cabinet and, and around him, you know. Bolton. Bolton. Yeah, I will never forgive him for that one. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that one okay. that one alone does it, man. Uh, yeah, impeach him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is a reason for impeachment is appointing <laughs> right. Bolton. Exactly. Oh. To your defense department. Oh, jeez. Anyway. Um, okay, so I have got one more story that's like completely unrelated to the rest of this. All right, but I think it's interesting. Yeah, and it's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> all right, too. But but it's interesting. So um, the Supreme Court uh, offered an opinion on a case roughly two weeks ago, I guess now, and the case was uh, Jack Daniel's Properties versus VIP Products. And you know, I'm a big fan of whiskey. Yeah, I've gathered, and um. I have said plenty of terrible things about Jack Daniels, but I'm actually only talking about old number seven. Yeah. They've got some good products. Jack Daniels puts out some of the best whiskey that you can buy. Yeah. Just not under that black label. <laughs> hey, right. All right. <laughs> so if you go in and you, you like, if you were a big fan of Jack Daniels, yeah. stop buying old number seven. Like, I don't spend know. Spend a little bit more money. Get the uh, single barrel select. Like that barrel proof single barrel select. Oh man, that's some good stuff. Or the single barrel rye is an excellent, excellent whiskey. It's a great rye whiskey. Yeah. I mean, there's like no bones. Um, yeah. Get bottled in bond. The bottled yeah. in bond is really very good. Yeah. Like stop buying that. 
to me, wussy no, 80 proof stuff to like me, buy number, a good whiskey to me number seven is like the college like frat party whiskey yeah like that's people what people get stuck there and they think it's great yeah that's but it's you're, not it's you're, terrible you're right but it's it's good for what <laughs> i it, drank it i mean like i know well, like it's, I, it's good know. for what it is though like, i mean it, at least if you're gonna drink it drink it with apple juice have an apple jack you'll yeah. be surprised it sounds terrible but You'll be surprised. Yeah, Applejack is where it's at. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I like Dr. Pepper. I like a Dr. Jack. Like, yeah. that was that was my thing in in my time at that age. You know, don't mix it with Kool Aid. Tried that is really awful. Oh, does Kool Aid not work? <laughs> no, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so but we, yeah, like just step up a little bit, buy some other Jack Daniels products. You'll find that what you've been drinking is not that good, and, yeah. but they do have really good whiskey. Yeah, that's not the point. This, of this is story. yeah, this is a complete Sorry. tangent. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's what VIP products did. Um, they do like dog chew toys. Okay. That are parodies of various liquors. Yeah. And so they have like a, 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 a Fido's that's like a parody of Tito's. And oh, yeah. Like things like this. All right. That so, sounds cool. So they put out a parody of Jack Daniels called Bad Spaniels. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, it, Jack Daniels sued them for copyright infringement. <laughs> well, so uh, the lower court um, favored VIP uh, and said that they have First Amendment protections because of parodies and so forth. Yeah. That they can make fun of Jack Daniels products and and make a product that looks similar but's different. Yeah, and that there was reasonably no different. Yeah, there was no reason to think that people would be confused that this was actually Jack Daniels. Yeah, because it's a doggy chew toy, not a liquor, and so, you know, so absolutely. On. All right. Um, this got brought up to the U- U.S. Supreme Court. This went wow. all the way to the Supreme Court. And the U- the United States Supreme Court overruled the lower court and yeah. said that this doesn't have First Amendment protections as a parody. Um, and they cited the similarities in the, uh, the size and shape of the toy to a regular Jack Daniels bottle, um, the similarities in the label, which is like the same color, uh, roughly covering the same area of the quote unquote bottle yeah. um, that uh, it, it was using the same type of stylized script um, and the same kind of like filigree border and so forth. Um, it used the same arc and the lettering and all, all kinds of stuff. Like it, they got very detailed. Yeah. You should look it up though. Actually it's, yeah, is you it, should see them side by side. It's, 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 this is one of those few times that it's really a shame. That this is audio only podcast. Yeah. Um, and maybe you should go out and buy it for your dog quick <laughs> <laughs> yeah. before they pull them all off the shelf. Apparently they'll be off the shelf. It's yeah. probably too late, actually. But yeah. anyway, um, now, historically speaking, uh, trademark infringement cases, like the crux, like the handle of trademark infringement cases, um, is related to the likelihood of the average consumer to be confused about the origin of the product. Yeah. So, to, And that seems reasonable to yeah. me. That, um, like, if you create a uh, a whiskey that's similar... Now, by the way, get Virgin Rare 101. It looks a hell <laughs> I was of a lot to like say, Jack Daniels. You brought home a whiskey one time, or brought over a whiskey one time, I was like, wow, like, that is a complete ripoff of yeah. Jack Daniels. They didn't use the same script in the lettering and so forth, but it's yeah, it looks close, a lot though. like... Yeah, it looked... Lo- it, but the, the name is so very different, too, though. Yeah. Um, but it does look, like, at first glance, like the Jack Daniels bottle. Oh, and, absolutely. by the way, it's yeah. Virgin Rare 101, for those of you out there that think that old number seven is awesome, yeah. you can actually spend less money, yeah. get a bottle that looks a whole lot like Jack, Dan- Jack Daniels called <laughs> Virgin Rare 101, and it's way better. It's better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the way generic better. wins. <laughs> so, <laughs> having made that point, <laughs> yeah. Um, the yeah. So it's it's generally related to people being confused and not thinking that they're getting the other product. Absolutely, that's, that's what it's yeah. been traditionally about. Um, now, the Supreme Court had some like kind of interesting opinions on this. This was a unanimous case, by the way. The entire yeah. Supreme Court agreed that that Jack Daniels was was the favored party. Really? Yes. That's the entire Supreme Court. Because that, that right rarely ever happens. Yes, exactly. Um, and it, Judge Alito wrote uh, one opinion um, where he was talking about, like, imagine a pitch meeting. You should read that because it's pretty funny. Yeah. And then you can probably think that, like, hey, 
that pitch meeting probably has happened to Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah. Or not far different Not far from, from it. it, yeah. If you've ever been to Lynchburg, Tennessee, yeah. you will see that Jack Daniels is a huge merchandiser. Oh, yeah. They have... They selling stuff. <laughs> ...hundreds of products. Like, going downtown Lynchburg, Tennessee, all the stuff with a Jack Daniels label on it, yeah. that's actually licensed Jack Daniels products. Yeah. I and mean, it, it's kind of unreal, like, how much merchandising they do. Yeah. Which may also have played a little bit of a part in this. Because yeah. it's not un it's not unreal to think that Jack Daniels could have created this dog a doggy toy. toy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, maybe that's kind of where, what this hinged on is the fact that they do have so many they they license so many products that this product could actually be mistaken mm-hmm. for a licensed Jack Daniels product. Yeah. Um I don't think, I mean, that's not what I got from the opinion. They didn't address it in that way. Yeah. Um, But the way they did address it is kind of interesting. Okay. So um, they say that uh, the purpose of a trademark is to identify the source of a good and, and this is the important part in this particular case, to distinguish from other people's goods, other, no, other businesses' products. That's probably a better way of saying it. Yeah. All right. And so um, their point here was that the the uh, VIP products was using a label that was a parody of the Jack Daniels label as their own label. Okay. So they were identifying their product explicitly with a parody of the identification of another product. Yeah. And that that was the problem here. Interesting. So, um, Essentially, the uh, parodying a trademark for use as a trademark yeah. is an infringement of the trademark. <laughs> Did that make sense? It makes sense. <laughs> okay, I, like it's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as much sense as it can make, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the problem was that the parodied material was actually used as the label for the product. Yeah, for the new product. I got you. Um, and so they they were using it to identify their product with another product. Yeah. And so it, it goes past that uh idea of that the the point of a trademark is to distinguish yourself from other people's yeah. products. And that because that they, they made their trademark look so much like since Jack. they made their label so much like the Jack Daniels label in order to identify their label with the Jack Daniels label that that becomes an infringement of the trademark. Gotcha. All right. So I, I just think that that's kind of interesting and kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's worth mentioning here also just because, uh, at least based on the um, the analyses that I read, it, it is really unusual for the Supreme Court to make such a clear and assertive stance on intellectual property issues. Yeah. And so because they made such a clear and assertive stance on intellectual property issues, trademark infringement in this particular case, in this case, um, that this case will likely be used or like frequently referenced in lower court decisions about other intellectual property cases in the future. Absolutely. So this may actually be like a really important case in the long term um, for how intellectual property issues are handled. As far as trademarks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, um... Anyway, that's the last thing that I've got. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, I don't have anything else. I'm definitely... Okay. Um, well, uh, again, uh, rest in peace, Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, f- everybody out there, everyone... it You know, the Doomsday Machine really should be required reading. Yeah. Just so that you know. And I, I know I keep saying that, like, my... Like, the, the position that I get behind most strongly... The like where my activism lies is in the abolition of nuclear weapons yeah. because I think they're a danger in and of themselves. Um, and I have a quote, but I don't have it here. And I would generally ask uh, Liberty Larry to like fill in the gap while I run and, and go grab the quote, um, but he won't. So instead, I'm going to hit pause on the recorder and I'll come back and read the quote. <laughs> that sounds fair. All right. Did you miss me? <laughs> sure. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> It makes me feel better about myself. <laughs> All right. Um, so this quote is from Enrico Fermi, who uh, worked on the the Manhattan Project. Oh, okay. He's like one of the originators of the original <laughs> atomic bomb. Okay. Anyway, um, afterwards he said this. I, 
this is, uh, I think this is an important quote. Like this is something um, people should remember about these things because people forget that they even exist. Yeah. Like uh, Scott Horton says something like, um, you know, whenever we're talking about uh, war with uh, nuclear power, um, the the possibility of a, a nuclear exchange goes without saying. And it's gone without saying for so long that it actually goes without saying. That is forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is what uh, Fermi had to say of atomic weapons. He said, quote, By its very nature, it cannot be confined to a military objective, but becomes a weapon which in practical effect is almost one of genocide. It is clear that the use of such a weapon cannot be justified on any ethical ground which gives a human being a certain individuality and dignity, even if he happens to be a resident of an enemy country. The fact that no limits exist to the destructiveness of this weapon makes its very existence and the knowledge of its con uh, construction a danger to humanity as a whole. It is necessarily an evil thing considered in any light. Yeah. So, y'all get on board with me. Let's start writing letters and yeah. see if we can put an end to nuclear weapons here. And I, I maintain, I have maintained for a long time that it's the United States that has to do it first. Oh, absolutely. No, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, th you There's, know, the thing is that the United States has conventional military power to be almost as destructive as nuclear weapons. Yeah. I mean, like, if anyone were to launch nuclear weapons against the United States, even if the United States didn't have nuclear weapons... We could just annihilate them. Yeah. We could absolutely destroy that country. Yeah. So, it's up to the United States to be the first one to put these things down. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, what what point do they really... I mean, like, especially like you talk about Russia or these other mm -hmm. countries that have them. Like, I mean, the, the whole idea is they're never going to use them. So. Yeah. The point of having them is to not to, to not use them. So don't have them. Yeah. Just if. Yeah, exactly. Because as long as they exist, the possibility that something goes wrong. Yeah. Will always be there. Yeah. Daniel Ellsberg actually talks about, um, you know, the period. This is actually probably still true, but. Certainly there was a time where the United States maintained a fleet of bombers that were always in the air with nuclear weapons. Yeah. Always in the air, just yeah. in case. Yeah. Because they didn't want, you know, bombers to be stuck on the ground uh, if after they were a needed. Yeah, if yeah. after a first strike nuclear attack from some other country yeah. um, to, you know, eliminate all of our threats. Um, so there were always bombers in the air with nuclear weapons. And they have a, a number of fail safes on them. And uh, I'm pretty sure this is from Ellsberg. Anyway, uh, apparently sometime in the 60s, I believe it was, um, over, I think, North Carolina. Some of the details are fuzzy to me on this story. I apologize to everyone. I might have yeah. some of this wrong. But in essence, the story is, yeah. is correct. Uh, but I think it was over North Carolina. Um, one of these bombs was accidentally dropped. Yeah. By a U.S. bomber over North Carolina. Yeah. Or whatever state. We're yeah. going to go with North Carolina for this. Yeah. And um, almost all of the fail safes failed. Yeah. And so like nine of ten fail safes failed to engage to prevent the, the bomb from going It'll off. Go and off. the last one did. Wow. And so the bomb didn't go off and they recovered it and there was no problem. And but the the other issue to that is that if all of the fail safes if one more fail safe had failed, yeah. And a nuclear weapon had gone off over the continental United States. Yeah. The US government could never admit that it was their error that had done it. They yeah. would have blamed it on the Soviet Union and launched a nuclear war. Yeah. And off to war we would go. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's like that close. So as long as these things exist, like just because we've made it so far without an accident like that, yeah, it's only a matter of time. Yep. As long as they're out there. And um, I've been reading a bunch of Carl Sagan, and uh, Carl Sagan is always talking about um, this uh, technological adolescence. And like whether we can survive our technological adolescence. Yeah. That, that every technological 
um, species must go through this point where they finally develop the ability to destroy themselves. Yeah. And it's a real question whether they succeed in not doing that. Yeah. So far we have. So far we have, but we haven't been here very long. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in this particular... Relatively speaking. Like yeah, well, yeah, but this particular device hasn't been in existence for, I mean, less than 100 years. Right. You know, so, I mean, that's nothing as yeah. far as time is concerned. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so this is something that we really need to put an end to. Like, this is a, this is a huge... This is the sort of Damocles, you know, hovering yeah. over the, the fate of all of humanity. But it's just, it's the genie out of the bottle thing. Like, you can't, once it's out, it's out, you know? I just, I don't see how you put it back in. Well, you don't have to put, uh, you don't have to put the technology of fission well, no, obvious, back in. Well, no, obviously not. But, I mean, even um, just talking about doing away with all the weapons, it just, I mean, you're right. It definitely has to come from us first. I don't mm -hmm. see any other way around that. But, I mean, look at the mess this country is in right now. But there is a real recognition worldwide of the danger of these things. Oh, without question. And the question. only reason that anybody pursues a nuclear weapon is because other people have them. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Well, it gives you... The reason these smaller countries pursue it is because it gives the dictator like a, well, you're not going to dethrone me now. Yeah. I mean, that's it's kind of a card they can play. Right. Um. But but they wouldn't need it without the existence of nuclear weapons on the other side. Well, I don't know that that's true, though, because, I mean, we could go in and destroy them without nuclear weapons anyway. That's, that's the true. whole reason they want to have the weapon is because they know if they have the weapon, we're not going to come in with our military and destroy them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, for them to still <sighs> yeah. have that button to press is important for them. Yeah, I guess that's true. But it's certainly easier to put the pressure on getting rid of it if you don't have them yourself. Oh, it's true. No, I 100% I agree. I, I think if there's any hope of doing away with these weapons en masse, mm -hmm. it has to come from us first. Yeah. Because in, and, and it makes sense because at the end of the day, we were the first to develop and use. Yeah, we're the only one to use. Only one to use first to develop. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it, it would... And we still have a first strike policy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is all the more reason that, like it's uh, like I say, I support it and I wish it would happen, but I just, I don't see the path. It yeah. would be different if I could see the path. Mm -hmm. and I just, I don't see it. Yeah. And, and I hate it because, like I say, I mean, it's absolutely something I support, but mm -hmm. I just, I, you know. Yeah, well, I don't see us getting to anarchism either, but... I don't see a path there either, but I believe in it. Yeah. Like, I mean, I like it. Just like keep it's... pushing in the right direction, man. Yeah. Uh, no, I, it's it's the truth. The same same mm -hmm. thing with, with that, too, you know. The, but I could see there eventually being a path to anarchism, you know. I can see there... I, I actually more easily see a path to abolition of nuclear weapons than anarchism. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that there's more of um, a desire by by the public, by, by the grassroots, by people in general, yeah. to have some kind of ruler class, yeah, um, than to have a weapon that they can destroy themselves with. Yeah. Like, I think the average human out there doesn't want nuclear weapons. It's yeah. only your like elite government people. Uh, maybe, but I think if you if you really started talking to people on the ground, you'd find out real quick that they're very feel fearful of other countries. Sure, and that 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 would drive their policy of keeping them. <laughs> well, I think it's easier to make the argument that um, the reason that you have to be fearful of other countries is because we have these weapons too. Yeah, yeah, but you got to make that <laughs> argument too. Yeah. Like and that, uh, I, I guess th I think that's an easier argument to make than um, you'd actually be safer, wealthier, and more secure if you didn't have a government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> you may be right. Um, people are really, uh, really tied into the idea of government. Oh, uh, they are. No, there's no question about that. I, I think they're far more tied into the idea of government than they are to having nuclear weapons. Maybe so. Um, I hope that. I, I hope that that's true, actually, <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's all just keep pushing in the right direction. Oh, absolutely. And, and maybe we get there someday. Yeah. And uh, and someday maybe we'll do another podcast.
Probably next week. Probably next week. <laughs> no guarantees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably next week. Um, of course, in the meantime, uh, you can follow us on Facebook and you can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, uh, and Podbean. Um, oh, I did add a new page to our website, uh, yeah. thelibertymike.com, um, which is just articles. They're all old, but... One day there will be new ones. But one day there will be new ones. I, I've actually written the new one. I just I need to go through and add um, links. Yeah. Uh, like supporting links. Cool. Um, and I have another article in mind, and I've been kind of motivated recently to start writing again. Cool. So, so yeah, ho- hopefully you will see more of those in, in the future. Awesome. It's all up to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> no pressure, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and nobody's giving me any pressure, which is why it's not getting done. Like, I really need a deadline. Yeah. There's somebody like kicking me in the ass. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, we plan to be back here next week, and you can do all those things in the meantime. Of course, like, subscribe, uh, leave reviews. Um, I don't know, whatever else. Like all the interactions help us. Um, get the message out to other people. It just, uh, you know, gets us into the algorithm. Actually, the last episode on YouTube, somebody made a comment, 177 episodes, and you finally made it into the algorithm. And it was somebody whose name I haven't seen before. So I'm (laughs) guessing it's the first time he saw any of our stuff. And he was like, oh, wow, there's this uh, show. Um... 177 episodes. Why have I never seen this before? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, thanks to that guy. If you're still listening, I, yeah. I really appreciate that. And you know, you can send me an email, Michael at the Liberty. Mike can explain what you mean. If I've got it completely wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we plan to be back here next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.